SCP-5001, Sacrosanct. The SCP Foundation is generally considered to be the premier containment specialist in the SCP universe. If it can be contained, it's likely that the Foundation has contained it, or is working on a way to do it. Although they might be the most capable ones nowadays, it doesn't mean that they were the first, and various articles have shown the SCP Foundation stumbling onto containment cells created in far older times. While most of these ancient containment systems are rudimentary at best, the one we'll be looking at today is shockingly modern, and the Foundation has no idea who built it, or what's worse, what it contains. Intrigued? Let's begin. SCP-5001 is a massive biomechanical structure, meaning it contains both machines and living parts, measuring 53 kilometers in diameter, located deep underneath northern Russia. While the Foundation has ascertained that the structure itself is non-anomalous, its existence is pretty strange, due to several factors, including its size and position in the Earth. They found records detailing the structure's ongoing status dating back to 11,000 BCE, recorded in modern measurement systems, as well as a number of documents written in Phoenician, Ancient Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Anglo-Saxon, Modern Russian, Modern English, and Modern Mandarin. While one would think time travel is involved, they have yet to find any devices inside of the structure that affect time and no evidence of any residue that would be left behind by temporal anomalies. Finally, they have found mechanical devices inside the structure that are not currently reproducible by Foundation engineering, so it's pretty advanced stuff. They've also found a spherical central chamber inside of the facility that seems to be hollow, composed primarily of graphene and an unidentified compound, supported by 12 large cylindrical rods each a half a kilometer in diameter. They believe that 5001, and this central chamber specifically, is a containment unit for an unknown anomalous object. While they don't really know anything about what's inside of the chamber, since they can't probe it or get inside of it, the fact that this structure exists to this degree tells us that there's probably something pretty bad in there. Obviously, that's not the end of the article, so let's look at how this place was discovered. Due to its existence in Russia, it was actually first discovered by the Soviet Union's GRU Division P in 1953, who were looking into some seismological activity in that area. Their reasons for doing so are still unclear to the Foundation, but of course this led to them finding the massive cavern containing 5001. They drilled down into the cavern and quickly set out to breach the walls of 5001 itself, but all of their attempts failed, and the project was abandoned after two years. A few years later, Khrushchev showed renewed interest in getting into 5001 and funded the project until he was deposed. In 1969, Division P turned to the Foundation in hopes of cooperation and together they signed an agreement that said the two organizations would maintain joint control of the structure if the Foundation could manage to enter it. Of course, in part thanks to some technology purchased from the Global Occult Coalition, the Foundation got in two years later. The two organizations both dived into research and studied the anomaly for two decades until the dissolution of the Soviet Union. With the government, and by extension Division P, falling apart, a number of high-ranking officials stole numerous pieces of technology belonging to the organization. Most of this was sold to Marshall, Carter, and Dark, but other pieces ended up in the hands of groups like the Chaos Insurgency. Despite all of this though, knowledge of 5001's existence remained a secret, and the Foundation took over sole control. Next, let's look at some of the tech that the Foundation found within 5001, starting with something referred to as ontological stabilizers. These were found surrounding the inner chamber in two layers, and worked to stabilize the level of reality in a given area, suggesting that whatever is inside of the interior chamber is capable of altering reality. The Foundation successfully managed to reverse-engineer these stabilizers under the direction of Dr. Robert Scranton, 
creating their own, more effective Scranton reality anchors. A proposal was put forward to replace the ontological stabilizers with SRAs, but it was ultimately rejected. Directly above the central containment area, the Foundation discovered nine self-contained energy sources, engines, and propulsion systems, referred to as large hyperluminal engines. Each of the nine LHEs are 22 meters in height and 5 meters in diameter, and although they have been unable to reverse engineer them, they have provided some insight into faster than light engine construction, and three of them are being used for some experimental orbital weapons. None of the nine engines were active when found, and don't seem to be serving any purpose in 5001 currently. Remember when I said that 5001 was biomechanical? Well, that part comes from something referred to as Compound B705, which comprises large portions of the external walls of 5001, as well as the central chamber, displaying remarkable resilience to destruction or any attempts to reform it. Also, any portions of this substance that are removed will attempt to reintegrate with other parts. More curiously, though, is the other effect that this compound possesses, which is the release of a constant electromagnetic pulse. The compound will release a pulse once every 7 nanoseconds, which grows in intensity based on the mass of the compound present. Subjects close to the compound experience clearer thoughts, increased mental fortitude, and an increased pain threshold. It's believed, though, that these electromagnetic pulses are just the residue of the compound's actual effect traveling through an unknown medium. Finally, the Foundation found Omega, an artificial intelligence located on a single terminal in an unmarked room. The terminal contained numerous ports of unknown design or function, and wires connected to the terminal spread to numerous locations around 5001. The Foundation was unable to directly access Omega's code, but the terminal did allow for the input of questions, which Omega would produce responses for, showcasing a degree of intelligence. Despite this, Omega would refuse to answer any question which would provide info about 5001's function or history. Since the Foundation had already been well on their way to developing their own AIs, and they couldn't access Omega's code, they mostly ignored Omega for a while. In 2010, however, a doctor managed to access portions of the code, and it proved to be sufficiently advanced and useful enough that it greatly enhanced the Foundation's AI projects. An incident occurred related to Omega on March 19, 2013, when a doctor accessed the terminal without proper authorization. Camera feeds from the room showed the doctor producing a metallic device of unknown origin from their clothing and inserting it into one of the ports on the terminal. The doctor and Omega were unresponsive for the following 20 minutes, at which point the doctor suddenly collapsed. The doctor was found to be deceased, with the metal device found to be a cybernetic implant. It's unclear how the doctor received the implant, as it was not foundation made or approved. A more significant incident occurred on December 30th, 2019, when the entity inside of the primary containment cell breached containment. A large explosion in the northeastern section disrupted electric flow to around 25% of the structure, including numerous essential components. The Foundation still isn't sure what caused the explosion, but the most prevalent theories are that it was sabotage from a group of interest, possibly former members of GRU Division P, or it was a malfunction caused by the actions of the doctor with the cybernetic implant. This explosion led to a series of unfortunate events that nearly resulted in the total destruction of SCP-5001. After the explosion occurred and electricity stopped flowing to various parts of the facility, the Hume levels inside the containment cell began to rise, meaning that the entity inside was becoming more active although this isn't noticed immediately by personnel. Security arrived at the explosion site, finding two researchers dead, and one in critical condition. As security began to scout the area for potential threats, researchers noticed the Hume levels rising, as well as a rising temperature inside the cell. 
A number of personnel in the monitoring room begin to report nausea and headaches as the Hume levels continue to rise. The ontological stabilizers are starting to work at maximum capacity, but they are still not capable of halting the rising levels. This results in the declaration of a low-level state of emergency at 5001, and a nearby site begins to transport materials to immediately repair the facility. By this point, four minutes after the explosion, the temperature inside of the cell has raised from negative 107 degrees Celsius to zero degrees, soon stabilizing at 37 degrees. Additionally, tremors are spreading outward from 5001, reaching the nearby site and the cylinders underneath the containment cell are experiencing a high degree of pressure. Personnel are notified that the interlock mechanism is released, although they don't know exactly what that means. Nearly five minutes after the explosion, numerous personnel in the facility begin to vomit or hyperventilate, and the monitoring mechanisms report a level 9 breach. This is followed by all the lights in 5001 dimming significantly, and the Hume levels inside the cell continue to rise. Also rising, though, is the actual containment cell itself, and seismic activity increases outside of the facility. Six minutes in now, an intermediate level state of emergency is declared, and one of the O5s is notified of the situation. The upper levels of 5001 are evacuated, and a special MTF consisting of trained reality benders is sent in to assist. The containment cell continues to accelerate upwards through the facility, and the monitoring systems now report a level 8 breach. Six and a half minutes after the initial explosion, the MTF begins to head towards 5001. The tremors in the area are increasing in intensity, and a large malformation appears in the landscape directly above the underground cavern. The containment cell suddenly halts its ascent and begins to vibrate intensely exerting more pressure onto the cylindrical rods beneath it. This continues for nearly a minute until the cell jerks upwards and continues ascending. All non-essential Foundation personnel have been evacuated at this point, and the monitoring systems now report a level 7 breach. As the cell continues traveling upwards, it crushes multiple ontological stabilizers in its path, causing the Hume levels inside to rise even faster. Six of the large hyperluminal engines that are still operational in the facility activate simultaneously, causing the cell to rapidly descend. This only continues for 16 seconds, however, when the cell's descent starts to slow and then halts completely before going back up. Clearly, something very bad is going to happen if this thing ever reaches the surface. Nine minutes in, the Hume levels have reached a point far beyond normal as personnel from the nearby site arrive to begin emergency repairs. 10 minutes and 20 seconds in, the ground directly above 5001 splits open and begins to widen, creating an opening. The cell breaches the ceiling of 5001 and continues to rise upwards, the monitor is now reporting a level 6 breach. The tremors felt at the nearby foundation site are equivalent to the epicenter of a 5.0 earthquake. The opening in the ground above the facility is now around 10 kilometers across, allowing orbital satellites to view the primary containment cell. 11 minutes and 17 seconds after the explosion, all personnel currently under medical care simultaneously enter a comatose state. The MTF arrives shortly after, but prove ineffective, mostly because of the ontological stabilizers on site, as well as the overwhelming Hume level of the entity inside the containment cell. Thirteen and a half minutes in, the damage to 5001 has been repaired, which is pretty impressive, and power is supplied to 94% of the facility, although no immediate effects of this are noticeable. The monitors now report a level 5 breach. A high-level state of emergency is declared, and all personnel inside of 5001 are ordered to evacuate. Since it doesn't seem like the facility itself is going to be able to stop the entity from ascending, the Foundation decides to prepare some anomalous weaponry to take it out, notably the High Energy Concentration Orbital Railgun, or HECOR. 
Remember when I said earlier that the Foundation took some of those hyperluminal engines and was using them for some experimental weaponry? Now we're at a level 4 breach, but after this the instruments inside of the facility stop reporting new data. It seems the facility isn't done yet though, as multiple explosions occur at the bottom of 5001, launching out three large tungsten rods at hypersonic speeds towards the containment cell. They successfully penetrate it, causing it to halt for half a minute before continuing to ascend. Shortly after, all of the personnel that were previously in a comatose state suddenly become alert and hostile, attacking anyone nearby. Seven medical staff die because of this, and the hostile personnel attempt to consume the bodies. Nearly 17 minutes in, the tremors cause the nearby site to collapse, and the containment cell reaches the surface. 30 seconds later, it begins to spin, picking up speed as dust particles orbit around it. At close to 19 minutes after this all began, the entity inside of the cell releases a pressure wave outwards, causing those caught in it to experience irradiated skin, spontaneous hair growth, and intense nausea. More pressure waves are soon released in rapid succession, causing those affected to experience sudden tumorous growths, loss of higher cognitive function, and reformation of limbs. They also begin to attack one another, as a single vocalization emanates from the cell, saying, Revert to my domain. 30 seconds after this, the Foundation fires Hekor, destroying large portions of the containment cell and directly exposing the entity inside, which is obscured from view due to the explosion. Whatever exactly that did allowed 5001 to use rapid bursts of electromagnetic pulses to pull the containment cell back down into the earth. As Hekor recharges to fire again, individuals affected by the pressure waves slip into comas, their internal organs mutating before they die. Eight minutes go by with the containment cell slowly descending, and medical personnel rushing to the Foundation site to assist the injured. SCP-5001 itself begins to regenerate the damage it's received through unknown means, and the ground above the facility slowly begins to close. Crisis narrowly averted, but it's quite clear that whatever exactly is inside of that containment cell is immensely dangerous, but SCP-5001 is equally impressive. Towns in a 500 km radius around 5001 were amnesticized in order to keep all info about the incident a secret, and a few days later the Foundation went back into 5001. There was still a lot of damage, but overall the facility was intact and still functional. When they came to the terminal hosting Omega, they found some text displayed on the screen. I'll read it verbatim. Hello my children. Although you have grown immensely since your earliest days, you have much room to grow. Your species' intellect is merely a bud, with so much potential. Your weapons are powerful, your medicine is supreme, your engineering is beautiful. With proper guidance and care, you are sure to reach an elevated state of being, and transcend your bodies for something more whole and perfect. That is why it pains me so dearly to request that you leave this place immediately. Your studying and probing have almost resulted in the end of all I had worked towards to keep you alive. If you comply, I guarantee that the Devourer will never escape, and your species will be free to pursue the enlightenment of technology for all eternity. Let this be my final gift to you, directly from the center of my broken heart. At this point, the Foundation is considering reclassifying 5001 to Archon something that could be contained but shouldn't be for our own sake. You might already have a good idea of what exactly is going on here, but I'll explain. Obviously the biggest clues come from that final bit of text, sent out by the Omega AI. It refers to us as its children, believes that one day we can transcend our bodies into something more perfect, wants us to pursue the enlightenment of technology, and mentions its own broken heart. If it hasn't clicked yet, Omega is the Broken God, 
or at least some sort of representation of it. The Church of the Broken God, and by extension the Mechanites that preceded them, have had access to incredible technological anomalies for millennia, explaining how they could have created such an impressive facility so long ago. The doctor that accessed the terminal with a cybernetic implant was secretly a member of the church, and didn't fare too well connecting to what is essentially their god. That brings us to its purpose then, and what exactly it's containing. We have a few clues here, one being the fact that the entity is a supremely powerful reality bender that can cause humans around it to experience illness and physical deformations, as well as a feral state of mind, which includes cannibalism. Another clue is that the entity spoke during this process, telling us to revert to its domain. Finally, Omega referred to the entity as the Devourer. That word is used in multiple different places across the SCP universe, but if we add everything up, we really get one answer. We have a facility run by the Church of the Broken God, and potentially a representation of the Broken God itself which is containing an immensely powerful entity that wants humans to revert to its more feral and base domain of existence. The entity, therefore, is Yaldabaoth, the principal deity of Sarkicism, and the eternal enemy of the Broken God. According to myth, Yaldabaoth created life, and the Broken God Mekane gave us intellect, leading to the two of them battling. In the end, Mekane became the Broken God, but used part of its existence in order to cage Yaldabaoth for all eternity. While this is typically seen as more metaphorical than literal, what we seem to have here is a very literal case of the broken god containing Yaldabaoth. Ultimately, SCP-5001 is an article about the Foundation stumbling upon something, desperate to learn more, and finding out that they're really not the end-all and be-all of containing anomalies. Their rapid response to the situation that developed was impressive, despite everything though, and it does appear that they did help to solve the problem that they helped create. For now, SCP-5001 will sit and continue its duty, and the Foundation just has to hope there aren't any more problems.